Welcome back to Watching Film and Barnador Films. I'm Seth Barnador. I'm joined today by a very special guest. If you're on Twitter, you've probably seen his ratings. You've seen his projections going around. I've got Kelly Ford of K Ford Ratings here. Kelly, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Seth. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of Florida fans have seen uh, your graphics going around about the brutality that is Florida's 2023 schedule. Uh, but I've been following you for a while. You always put out great stuff, so I want to get you on to talk a little bit about that. You also do really cool things with historical numbers, so I want to get you on to kind of discuss some of those too before we get too far into the season and we and we kind of lose those kind of things, those to get them back burner. Um, but you know, before we get into it, kind of what's your background? How'd you get into this? Because there's you're kind of um, a guy that I, the last few years has really I thought come to the forefront of kind of these analytics analytic college football analytics guys you're you're you've made your way right up so what's your background how'd you get into this yeah well i appreciate that seth um really um my background i'm from central indiana originally still live here uh, just outside of indianapolis i went to purdue for undergrad where i majored in mechanical engineering um and so i've always had a knack you know going back to very early days my mom's a high school math teacher i've always liked math numbers stats probabilities that's always kind of been my wheelhouse and i've always loved college football um and so I was always a big fan of uh, Bill Connolly with his SP plus and Brian from with FEI. Those were kind of the two guys that as everyone's talking about, Hey, my team's ranked this in the AP and I'm ranked there. And my strength of schedule is this. I, I wasn't really engaging in those conversations. I was more looking, well, what are the predictive analytics think about these teams as we're trying to figure out who are the, the quote best teams in college football year in and year out. And so after many years of observing and studying Brian and Bill's work, I decided, you know what, I, I want to jump in here and I want to kind of make my own numbers. I'd been doing it for a little bit uh, on the side behind the scenes just with my friends. And they said, you got to you got to put this stuff out there. So I did that, geez, back in 2019 and made a Twitter account and a, a web page, a website. And uh, it's been fun ever since then. But my stuff is very similar to to Brian and Bill's, I would say, since those are the two that I really kind of modeled my model after, uh, if you will. And so uh, I try to be like them in, in many respects. And then I'm also always looking for ways that I can differentiate myself. And uh, what do I think, what can I prove through back testing has predictive value that either Brian and Bill um, don't think do, or they just haven't publicly stated they think do, which is probably more more so the case. Um, but yeah, that's that's how I got started and why I got started. I love college football and uh, always love the numbers. So mash those two together, and here we are with the K Ford ratings. No, it's been a it's been a great uh, mashing together there. It's, uh, I, I've been following you for at least a couple of years now. I really enjoy your stuff. Um, but uh, it kind of just going through the preseason prep and things. Some things that you've put out caught my eye. Uh, one was uh, Florida, the difficulty of Florida's schedule. You've got them ranked. There's been a bunch of different uh, kind of power rankings and strength of schedule rankings going around, but you've got them with the number one hardest schedule in the country. Um, and and uh, I'll, I'll pull that up here in a second. Uh, but I, I also saw you say kind of that you're, you're, you're a guy that believes in Billy Napier. You think he's a good coach. Uh, but he's being dealt a pretty tough hand this year. So um, what are your thoughts on Napier kind of as a kind of an outside observer, kind of where he's come from? Where do you think he's headed with the Florida program? Yeah, uh, I am a big fan of Billy Napier. I said that when I, I tweeted some things about Florida and with the projected win totals this year, which I know we'll get into, you know, 6.1 wins on average is what I have. And Florida fans might think, well, we had six last year. Is that even an improvement? I do think this team is is better from a power rating standpoint coming into this year than they were last year in year one under Napier. I think Napier is a good coach. I mean, look at his track record it, at, at Louisiana. All he did was win. And I know it's it's Louisiana. That's, you know, group of five Sunbelt. That's not SEC power five. That's not the quote big boys, if you will. But he was competing with the same level of resources as those around him and was was doing very, very well. You go back farther than that, he's been with Nick Saban, who I think is the greatest college football coach of all time. And anybody who spends time, uh, multiple stops, if I'm not mistaken, with him um, is certainly going to pick up knowledge and, and, and be a good coach moving forward. I know it didn't work out ultimately at Clemson as the OC, uh, but again, that's 10, 15 years ago now, and he's grown since then. I very much believe in Billy Napier. I think he is the right guy. I think it was telling that the Florida administration, how that how that search went and, and how happy they were that they landed him. Uh, geez, 18 months ago now it's been. Um, but as you said, Seth, 
it is a very tough schedule. Number one, most difficult in the entire country by my numbers. And so that's one of the reasons why I like looking at teams and seasons and schedules through the lens of power ratings is it, it can kind of, um, it, it can bring it into focus, right? Six wins is not six wins everywhere in the country. If you get six wins at Florida this year, it's much different than if you got six wins at a, at a Louisiana or at a Miami of Ohio, for example. So um, given the strength of the schedule, I think six wins would be would be a great season for or a good season for Billy Napier. Um, and I do think it's possible they could they could surprise and win a couple more. But I have faith in Billy Napier. And as we look forward, we were talking before the show started at the 2024 schedule. It's not going to get any easier. <laughs> so, you know, the Florida administration, I have to think they're viewing it through this rational lens as well. And while you're not stacking 10 win seasons year over year here to start, the schedule is very difficult. And as long as you continue to build up that talent roster, which he's certainly on the right track here, um, I think the future is bright in Gainesville. Yeah, I think the he may have walked into the hardest first three years of uh, schedules any coach has relative to talent um, outside of like a Vanderbilt. Uh, but you know, I, I think the positive thing for him is that if you're taking positive steps these next two seasons, you'd have to feel pretty confident that he is the guy going forward. If he can, if he can make those positive steps with the schedule, and we'll throw up this year's schedule, kind of what you put out on your kind of realistic expectations. This is always a really cool uh, thing you put out. And so let's go through this. Um, we see last year you were pretty close with your expectations down in the bottom left corner there. Uh, you had Florida as a 6.9 win team. Then it went in six. They had a couple games during the during the season where um, I would imagine their post game win expectancy was uh, a lot. <laughs> they ended up losing. Their, they had a pretty high post. I think the Vanderbilt game is one that was a really weird, fluky game with a special team turnover and uh, another turnover that turned into a touchdown. So um, you were pretty much spot on, though. They ended up winning six. You had them at six point nine. Um, so how, how did you feel kind of last year? Did was that about kind of what you thought coming into year one? Yeah, it's it's it, it's tough as you're trying to judge a team with a new coaching staff. My model to this point does not explicitly account for coaches and their staffs, which would be a great ad. I'd love to get in there one day. Uh, just haven't haven't been able to do that as of yet, trying to quantify uh, the impact and, and predictability that a that a coach and coaching staff have on a team and its performance throughout the year. Um, but yeah, last year projected six point nine wins. They got to six, as you see there in the bottom left. That ranked eight, that minus nine uh, point nine, excuse me, ranked eighty fourth nationally in the country relative to expectations coming into the year. But as you can see see on the left there as well, the last two years, the year-end K-4 power rating at the end of the year for Florida has ranked 31st and 30th nationally in 2021 and 2022. Coming into this year, you can see that number is, is, is 25. So I do think this, this team is, is trending the right way in terms of talent. Um, and then as you look at the bottom right there, you can see, as we talked about the schedule difficulty, it's the number one most difficult schedule in the entire country. Of course, that means it's the number one most difficult within the division there in the SEC East. But this Florida team is going to play the fifth most difficult collection of opposing FBF offenses by my number. And, and then in the same vein, the 18th most difficult collection of defenses. But if you scroll, if you roll down that uh, offensive column of the opponents, you're look, you start with Utah, you know, they're projected top 15 offense. Then you get an FCS team in McNeese. Tennessee's a top five offense, South Carolina top 25. And in the back half of the schedule, everybody is top 25 with the exception of Missouri um, as it stands right now in my projections in terms of offense. So uh, this defense, which is the side of the ball that I have the most questions about right now for Florida, mm -hmm. is certainly going to be tested. And that will probably be uh, the determining factor in can Florida exceed the expectations that I have this year of about 6.1 wins? If that defense is better than expected, they'll have a good chance. If, if they're not, um, those opposing offenses may may cause problems. Uh, but yeah, a 66% chance to go bowling this year. Um, again, given the difficulty of the schedule, I, as an outsider, would be happy with that. As a Florida fan, I understand the the expectations within the program. Of course, you, you want to be better than that. But um, again, year two, given time, I think it's going the right way. Yeah, I think uh, bowl and maybe a, a bowl bowl eligibility and then a win maybe you don't expect. I think six seven with a, a seven with a win you're not quite expected to have. I think people would be pretty excited about. Um, do you, you feel like the offense is going to stay pretty steady uh, year over year? Is that kind of your feeling? Uh, you have them twentieth here. I think I think they ended up probably pretty close to that, and a lot of. Um, advanced stats ratings last year just because they were so explosive they were able to be so explosive at times 
they, um, they, they, cer- they certainly were last year. And, and yeah, so for me, Seth, when it comes into the, the preseason ratings, much like Bill Connolly at SP Plus, I'm looking at three main things. It's returning production, which – Florida uh, grades out pretty poorly, um, especially relative to to some other big players in the SEC and nationally lost a lot of production from last year. Mm. But um, that's not the end of the world for a program that recruits at the level that Florida does. And then also that has the recent K-Ford rating history that Florida does as well. Uh, Florida ranks 17th in um Average K-Ford rating over the last four years weighted with the m- most recent year most heavily. And they ranked 13th in my most in my recent recruiting uh, component of the preseason rating. So the offensive side of the ball, of course, there was some production loss, most notably, you know, Anthony Richardson coming to my Indianapolis Colts. Oh, actually, Curious to see how that goes uh, and how it translates into the NFL. But I still... Given the way that this team has has recruited and replaced talent um, and also just the history that they have, this is a team that, yes, there are going to be questions. And I think I'm maybe a little bit higher on Florida than than some other power ratings and certainly the polls out there. People are saying there's no way Florida should be anywhere near a top 25 poll. And I'm like, well, this isn't a poll first, first <laughs> off, but putting that point aside from a power rating standpoint, I don't expect Florida to be ranked in the top 25 at the end of the year because their schedule won't be that of what a of a human poll top 25 look team looks like. But from a power rating standpoint, I absolutely believe this team can hang around the top 25, top 30 throughout the year, even as they go through the gauntlet of the schedule. So there are question marks on both sides of the ball, to be honest. Um, but I still think there's enough there that this team uh, from a power rating standpoint is, is in the right ballpark. Yeah, what do you think? Uh, you know, what what are some games that are kind of swing games that kind of people should be kind of watching out for? Maybe if if they could sneak this one, um, that would kind of go a long way to exceeding expectations, or or ones that maybe, uh, you know, or, or there's a couple that are pretty close to a coin flip in here. Uh, would those be one, would those be ones to watch that if you lose that one, uh, maybe you you don't hit those expectations you've got. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as I'm looking at swing games, I'm looking really at anything within a touchdown, really. Um, even that opening game at Utah, the reason that I that I think that game might be okay for Florida, actually, I like it better in week one than I would any other week of the season because Florida's going to have all off season to be preparing for Utah. Now, Utah has it too, of course, but when you're the underdog and you've got more time, the, the longer you have to prepare, the better for the underdog. And so, for Florida, if they can somehow, you know, spring an upset, you know, in Salt Lake in week one, that'd be a big upset. Um, I tell you, you'll be, Florida will be number one on my most deserving rankings uh, <laughs> after week one. I can tell you that uh, if they're able to beat Utah there. Um, but that game aside, because I, I don't really consider that one quite a swing game, even Tennessee at five and a half, the spread will likely be larger than that, given, you know, Vegas is trying to balance the money. They're not necessarily yeah. trying to exactly get it what is the projected spread between these teams once home fields accounted for they're trying to balance the the money that's coming in so that spread will probably be a little higher for swing games i'm looking at kentucky so currently a two-point underdog by my numbers can florida go out and win that game south carolina is a pick game by my numbers a lot of people are going to like south carolina in that game especially by the fact that it's at South Carolina. If that's a night game, that's bad for Florida. Um, <laughs> going into that stadium at night is not easy. Um, coming off the bye, then you get Georgia. You know, if Florida wins that game, everything, <laughs> give give Napier the extension right then and there, I'd say. They, start, um, they I, might start building the statue. Yeah, yeah that, that, like that's it. an unlikely one. Uh, Going to have to get Arkansas. My number's like that by three and a half. So y- you don't want to be on the wrong – you don't want to flip the wrong way there. Um, and then they'll, even the last two games, you know, at Missouri is a pick them, and then – a lot of people really like Florida State this year. And, and admittedly, my numbers like Florida State more and more with every single update that I do of the numbers. They're up to number 10 now in my preseason power ratings. Um, but that is a game. It's in the swamp. That is a game where if Florida's season hasn't gotten off the rails, if, if this is still a team that is bought in, committed, and I have no reason to believe that they won't become that time, um, who knows how Florida State season's going. They got a cu- couple tough games to open the year in their first four weeks. They've got two really tough ones. They drop those, things could spiral. And so um, that game right now is plus six for Florida. Who knows, though? That could be a game that the Gators end up getting at the end. But any game that's projected within a touchdown, those are the ones, if you win more than not, you're, you're going to have a good chance to to meet or exceed your expectations. If you lose more than not, that's that's how you can end up on the wrong side of that at the end of the year. Yeah, and there's <laughs> like as we just went through, there's quite a few of those on, on the board there. So, um Speaking of Florida State, we I, I, I talked to you briefly beforehand. Um, one thing I wanted to look at, and now Florida State, I think, is, um, as you mentioned, has gotten even higher up. I think at one point, Florida and Florida State were a little bit closer in your power ratings uh, maybe a few weeks back. 
Um, and it got me to thinking, what would the what would the preseason expectations look like if both those teams just switched schedules? So how much of expectation is based purely on kind of uh, the difficulty of the schedule? So um, I know I think you ran some on that. What 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 did you find kind of if if we were able to do that? Yep, absolutely. So if Florida State played Florida's schedule. Right now, I'm projecting for Florida 6.1 wins against their schedule, as we just said. If Florida State played Florida's schedule, I'd be projecting 8.1 wins for the Seminoles. So really, it's about a two-game difference. Yeah. Florida State's about two games better against Florida's schedule than Florida is, is how my numbers are viewing it right now. Um, and then conversely, if we flipped that, if we looked at the uh, Florida State schedule and said, what if Florida got to play it? So Florida State, I'm currently projecting 9.4 wins for Florida State against their schedule. If Florida was playing Florida State's schedule instead of their own, I'd be projecting 7.5 wins. So again, that's you know 1.9, two games different. So either way you slice it, Florida State's looking about two games better than Florida this year. You are right, Seth, in my most recent updates. If I remember correctly, I had Florida State number 14 and I had Florida number 18 actually. Those yeah. two teams are some, they were some of my biggest risers and fallers, actually. Funny enough, in my most recent update, Florida stayed up to number 10 and, and Florida down to number 25. The margins are, not, they're like, wow, okay, that's a long way to fall. What changed? The margins are not very big between those. As we saw, Florida State's number 10, Florida's number 25. That spread, granted, it's at Florida, is only six points. So there's a lot of teams. Once you get away from, you know, the first couple teams, the top couple teams, college football, they start stacking up really yeah. quickly. Um, but either way, if you flip the schedules here, Florida State coming out about two games better than Florida. But again, if you're Florida, you're thinking, okay, if we have this exact same team, but we're playing Florida State schedule instead of ours, instead of 6.1 wins, now we're looking at 7.5 wins. Yeah. Now you're thinking about the season a whole lot differently because you're looking at like maybe an eight and four a year as opposed to six and six. Yeah. So that's, that's just another way to frame the difficulty of the schedule and the impact that it then has on your record. So we have to keep that in mind when we're judging coaches on, on the record that they have. They're not in a vacuum. These schedules are serious, especially in college football, where there's such a vast disparity between the most difficult and the easiest. Yeah. I, and, and you have something else, um, you know, just speaking to the difficulty of Florida schedule. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up here because I, it does a really good job of kind of, I think you put this out earlier today. Uh, no, not that one. Um, just in terms of your, the, your average top 25 team, what, what they're uh, in Florida state's obviously an above average team. So you have them, you had them at uh, over eight wins with the schedule, but, Yep. So on my on my website, Seth, as, as you're looking for it there, um, you can see. And yeah, here it is from the from the Twitter posting. Again, you can find these on my website, k4ratings.com. Yeah, uh, every, check that, every, guys. Check that site out. It's it, chock full <laughs> of uh, fun information. It, it's uh, I, I thought, you know, what? I'm, I have this website, but I don't really use it for anything except during the season. I post the updated stuff. I was like, people are always asking for certain things. I need to start posting <laughs> to the website when I'm posting on Twitter. That way people can go back and find it easier. So I've been working on that here the last couple of weeks. I've been on vacation from work. So that's been a fun, fun project for me. But anyway, what we see here is what you are alluding to. So this is how I judge schedule difficulty because there's actually a few different ways we can look at quote strength of schedule, uh, which, which really is, it's not a, it's not a metric. It's really a descriptor. So we should be careful about how we use that, that phrase strength of schedule. That's why I say schedule difficulty instead, but Florida has the most difficult schedule in the country. And how I measure that is if I looked at every single team schedule and viewed it through the lens of the average top 25 team, so the team that would be right in the middle of my top 25 a power rating, how would they do against this schedule? The average top 25 team would be expected to win about 7.7 .7 games against Florida's schedule. Now, Florida being below the average top 25 team, right? They, they're at number 25, we said. That's why they're at 6.1. The average top 25 team would only be able to win 7.7 .7 games. It's very, very difficult. Um, then number two, you can see Auburn, Ole Miss, both there at about at about uh, eight. And then Florida State is actually on the next graphic on the website. Uh, they're at number 35. Um, they have 9.05 expected wins is what the average top 25 team would have against Florida State schedule. Now, Florida State, as you mentioned, is above top 25, so they're going to get 9.4. So yeah. that's how I rank schedule difficulty is let's normalize it. Look, through, look at everybody's schedule through the same lens, the average top 25 team. 
how many wins would that top 25 team be expected to get against your schedule? That's how Florida comes out number one. And it's actually, that's a pretty significant gap from 7.69 to 7.99. That's a pretty large gap, especially as you look. I mean, that point three is as big as the gap from Ole Miss at three to, um, so I guess, Missouri at eight, right? And so, and, and then the gap gets smaller and smaller as you go down the list here. So, uh, this is just one way to quantify schedule to give difficulty, and it's uh, worked well for me in the past. So that's the one I like to use. Yeah, I enjoy I enjoy the way you frame uh, the schedule and throughout the year the the most deserving as well that ranking. I think that's a really good way to contextualize the season up to date. I know um, like last year TCU was always pretty up pretty high up in your most deserving, and I think it was a really good way to kind of to contextualize before it really caught on that hey they're going to make the playoff probably. So. Um, Really good stuff. Now, one other thing you do that I don't think anybody else really delves into that I wanted to get with you a little bit is uh, you do historic team ratings. So you kind of go back and explain kind of how you how those are viewed. They're not necessarily all years combined. Right. How, how do you how do you kind of do those ratings? And then we'll kind of delve into some of the Florida ones. Yep, for sure. And so um, you said maybe not a lot of other people do this. And I think you're right. Definitely fewer people are into the historical space than the power rating in the current year. But there are some. And Bill Connolly, of course, uh, one of the godfathers who I referenced earlier, he he does. Um, he does do this as well with his SP plus historical. So that's kind of what one of the things that gave me the idea back when I, when I started thinking about this. What I'm able to do is so I have my model that I use for current year power ratings projecting forward. I thought, what if I used a variation of that model and retroactively ap applied it to previous seasons of college football? And so this was a massive project that I undertook uh, geez, a couple summers ago now, where I basically went back to the beginning of college football, which is 1869. And things were much different then, as you mm -hmm. can imagine, including the scoring and points at what, what everything is worth. So it really wasn't a comparable game until a little bit later into the history of, of college football. But I said, I'm going all the way back to the very beginning. I'm going to apply a uh, skeleton variation of the model. It's kind of a, it's really a points per game, really, because you're not able to get the stats that I need, the inputs that I need for my model in today's college football are not available, at least publicly to me, anywhere that I know on the internet to be able to um, apply the current version of the model to historical season. So um, it's a it's a rough estimate where I'm able to generate a power rating, an estimated power rating for every single college football team that's ever played the sport. And so I can look back and see in the 1996 season, who was the best team and by how much in the 1936 season, who was the best team and by how much. And so I'm able to then take that raw power rating and generate it into the zero to 100 scale that I use today um, for teams. And we can kind of stack teams up within a given season. One thing to note is that a, a power rating of 98.5 in 2022 is not necessarily equal to a power rating of 98.5 in 1992 or in 1922. It, it's you're basically that's a percentile rank within any given year. So if you have a power rating of 98.5 in 1992, you were in the 98.5 percentile of all college football teams playing at the highest level of college football in 1992. So that's just some important context to consider, but it's been a really fun project. I, I did a revision to it here this summer that I just wrapped up uh, about a week or so ago. And um, again, I've made some tweaks to my model. And so I was able to find some ways that I think I can better approximate historical team strength going back to previous seasons. Yeah, cool stuff. I, I was I've been thinking about having you on or asking you to come on uh, to talk about this for a while. And I saw you updating the historic. I was like, oh no, I hope. But then I, I saw you finish from last week. I was like, perfect timing. Uh, so let's talk Florida. So um, I think there's a lot of there's I'm sure there's a ton of debate throughout the fan base on which national championship team is the best. Some are you know love Spurrier. Some are with the Urban Meyer teams. Who do you have as, as the top, the top of the top there? So, so my top, I'll give you the top five Florida yes, teams yes. Uh, in my historical da data set. And again, they, they're ranked by their, their K Ford power rating, year end power rating in that year. But as we, as I just said, it doesn't necessarily mean that this team was actually better than that one. It's just within that year, they were more dominant. So this yeah. is really not necessarily who would have beaten who, but, 
who was better relative to the rest of the college football the year that they were playing is kind of how we should frame this. My number one Florida team of all time has the number 11 best K4 power rating ever, 99.63. So the 99.63 percentile of all teams playing, and they were the number one team in the data set this year. It was 2008. So the 2008 Florida team for me, it's the 11th best K Ford rated team of all time, 11th most dominant relative to their competition in that year. To me, 2008 was number one. I have 1996 Florida as the number two team. They come out number 30 all time historically. And then I actually have 2009 Florida at number three, just ahead of 2006 Florida. So the team that uh, lost to Alabama yeah. in the SEC championship game, I actually have power rated as a better team than the team that won it all back in 06. Um, the 2009 team ranks number 45 in, in all time, and the 2006 team ranks number 198. Just after that, I actually have 2001 Florida um, coming in as the fifth best Florida team by K Ford rating all time. So all those teams pretty recent. Um, it, it, you'd have to go back to, I got the 1995 team after that, 1983 after that, 97, 91, a couple teams in the 80s. Uh, you have to go all the way down to the 1966 Florida team to really get going back in, in time. And they are the 17th best Florida team by my numbers, um, yeah. 1966. Yeah, those uh, the mid the eighties is when it really started to really yep. started to pick up there. And I, uh, I'm assuming eighty four, eighty five are those other eighties teams. Yep, yep. I got nineteen eighty four is the tenth best. Eighty five is eleventh best. Yep. yep. And what's interesting is some you know there's some that think that the two thousand one team was Spurrier's best team. Uh, they lost they lost more than uh, some of his other teams, but. Talent wise, I thought that one was the best. So that one's top. You had that one top five. I had them number five. Yep. Yeah. And there so. is, I mean, they had a, they got a, about a 96.9. So there is a little bit of a gap really between, I mean, the, the, the top three, I'd say, uh, 2008, 96, and 09. Those are all top 45 teams all time by power rating, all with a 98.95 or better. So, those teams really separated themselves. Then you kind of got 2006 um, and 2001 a, a little closer mm -hmm. together uh, before you get into some of those other teams. The 09 team, that's an interesting one. You can't, They're kind of forgotten just because they lost Alabama. Then they went on to just pummel a pretty good Cincinnati team. That was a it was a really really good team, and if they beat Alabama in that SEC championship game, I mean, yeah. they're viewed historically much differently, and that's yep. you know the nature of it, and that's why we love you play the games, and that's another thing people always say, oh these these numbers are great, but ultimately they're going to play the game. I'm like, yeah, and that's yeah. the best part when they play the games, but it's July. This gives us something, yeah, we need something to, to talk about. This gives us something to talk about. It gives us a frame of reference on how to view teams. They are not the end all be all power ratings or, or predictive analytics, but they can certainly give us a frame of reference when looking at a team or looking at a schedule. So yeah, don't get me wrong. When the fall rolls around and we get to play the games, that is the best part. And the numbers will reflect that eventually, but we don't have any 2023 season data yet. So no. we're working with what we got. And as you have on your site, a very welcome addition the countdown clock. Yeah. How much we time we've got to we're actually playing games. So uh it. K this is K4ratings.com. Check it out. Kelly, where else can they find you? Um and keep up with you. Twitter is kind of where I first found you. Um are you on threads or have you <laughs> So I, I haven't gotten into the thread game yet or a sub stack or any of that. Um, maybe that's something I should be doing, but I haven't, haven't done it yet. You can find me on Twitter at KFord Ratings and then the website KFordRatings.com, as Seth just showed there too. Um, talking to a couple different outlets about potentially writing college football this fall. So we'll see what comes out of that. But hoping to get more of my my content out there for people to enjoy. Um, but yeah, for now, at KFord Ratings, KFordRatings.com, those are the two best, best places to find me. Yeah, if you're a college football fan, you need to be following Kelly and all his stuff. He puts it out consistently and puts out a lot of stuff every week. And he can really just following his ratings can give you a lot of really good context on what's happening during the season. So, Kelly, thanks again for hopping on with us. I appreciate it. Uh, no, good I, luck I appreciate to see. Good luck. Good, good, good luck. With, I know you're going to be working a lot this year. So, good luck with. Uh, the 2023 season coming up here. There's a lot to do, but it, it, it's labor of love. I appreciate you having me on, Seth. This was so much fun, and best of luck to Florida. Again, keep <laughs> keep the course, uh, hang in there with, with Billy. I think it's going to work out in the end. But uh, thanks so much, and this has been this has been great. So go Gators. All right.